So we started with a statement this time, how can we make trap neuter return work for everybody? Oh, doing it wrongly already. No. Yeah, doing that. Okay, all right, thank you. Yep, so the question, I'm just going back one now. So the question is, who is everyone? If we want to say, how can we make it right for everybody? Next. The stakeholders who will be affected by the decision include all of those people that you can see on the screen, not just people, I mean all of those persons or living beings that are up on the screen. And next. So we have a range of people up here today who are going to sort of cover quite a large number of those different stakeholder groups. And so as well as the four people that you've already heard present this morning, we also have Dr Chris Dickman, who's Professor in Terrestrial Ecology and Director of the Institute of Wildlife Research at the University of Sydney. Welcome, Chris. Uh, we have Dr Maggie Lilith, um, who has done her PhD on do pet cats have an impact on species richness and abundance of native animals in low density Western Australia suburbia. So we were very interested in that. We have Mark Kumpf back again. Thank you, Mark, who's going to give the local government perspective from his perspective on TNR. And we have Shell Williamson, um, who is our um, pet rescue founder in Australia and a trap new return advocate. So um, just a couple more slides and then we will be hearing uh, five minutes from each of those people before we open up for questions. So I just wanted to let you know first, we have a bit of a history at our summits. Many of you in this room have been coming all the way since 2006, which is our first summit. And we had two representatives from the organisation called ASCATS, who was, which is a totally trap new to return organisation, um, come to our first summit. And we spent four hours on a Saturday morning with representatives from all stakeholder groups. Um, and we came up with this list of issues. Uh, and as you can see, they're very much, I won't go into depth on them because they're very much the things that Lila just went through that have been coming up, obviously, all over the world in relation to issues. And uh, so the second page, we had a huge long list of issues. So we didn't get far beyond the issues. So that's why today we're trying to be as much as we can solution focused and trying to hear, well, what are the things that we could do to progress this from people? Mm. Next. Oh, two, one back, yep, no, next one. So, who needs to be involved in the planning and decision making? Well, that was the list that we came up with in 2006. And the next. Um, and the actions from the 2006 discussion included keeping an open mind and working towards creative solutions knowing that there was a whole range of ideologies and we would get nowhere if we weren't a little bit flexible and we listened to lots of different points of view. Um, educating people, training people, doing more research, developing relationships, identifying different types of colonies um, and possibilities for actions that might be appropriate for the different types and developing appropriate codes of practice and guidelines. So that's as far as we sort of got in 2006. Um, it's already been presented today that there's a bit of a turnaround in what's happening, particularly in the US, and I was interested to listen to some webinars that were just recently presented by Maddie's Fund um, with Kate Hurley and um, a number of people from various counties, animal, particularly for animal management people in the room, uh, where some pounds and shelters in the USA are refusing to take healthy stray cats now. Is that right, Lila? Yeah. And so basically, um, I've just picked up on a little thing that came up in that webinar. The times they are certainly are changing is my take on it. The city of Jacksonville recognises the need for innovation in addressing the issues presented by feral, free roaming and other community cats. To that end, it recognises that there are community caregivers of cats and acknowledges that properly managed community cats may be part of the solution to the continuing euthanasia of cats. And next, 
Community cats means any free roaming cat that may be cared for by one or more residents of the immediate area who is or are known or unknown. A community cat may or may not be feral. Community cats shall be recognised from other cats by being sterilised and ear-tipped. Qualified community cats are exempt from licensing, stray and at-large provisions of this ordinance and may be exempt from other provisions directed towards owned animals. If a person is providing care, cats must be fed daily and cats must not be allowed to suffer. But it was made clear in the webinar that it says if. So there's a broadening acceptance that they may not even have a determined dedicated carer, but the caregiver certification program may be provided by the city. So, um, and San Jose County, a representative from San Jose Ca County is also on that webinar talking about the government agency being the primary participant in trap, neuter, return, um, doing the spay, neuter, the vaccination, the chip and the ear tip, and the non-profit rescue groups taking the cats from the shelter and releasing the cats, and also providing the non-profits providing the educational materials, the website and the phone line for questions or concerns. So times are really moving on. Uh, we hope to have an ethical basis for this summit and we realise our moral responsibility is to all living beings and so we have to care about the owned and unowned cats and dogs who value their lives and are sentient beings as well as the animals they impact on and the humans who are trying to sort out this incredibly complex, often ethically inconsistent relationship that we have with other animals. Um, so one of the ways that... Um, I thought, in, you know, once we go through this in the future, would be to use um, an ethical decision-making model, which basically involves using ethical principles, such as respect for life, respect for well-being, looking at various actions and stakeholders, and weighing it up, if you look at the bottom, in terms of a, a justice principle, justice is fairness, and in terms of integrity and virtue, in other words, trying to find consistency with our values across all animal species. And although we don't have time to go through that today, that would be one example of the way we maybe could try to sort through some decision making on this very complex issue, where we might across the top look at trap neuter return in managed urban areas where limited wildlife and no endangered threatening species, trap neuter return everywhere, trap and kill, poison and shoot and actually look through the stakeholders and tick and cross and look at the benefits and harms that might result from those particular actions and then weigh them up at the bottom. So that's just my example of filling in how it could be done as a possible way forward. So what is the most ethically desirable and fitting decision? We're now going to have five minutes from each of our um, stakeholders who uh, haven't been had the opportunity to do a longer presentation. So I'd like to now welcome uh, Dr. Chris Dickman uh, to come and pre present. He has just a couple of slides here on my um, list, so if we could put those on, please. Thank you. you might just, thanks very much, Chris. You might have to just either press the right one or just say mm, here. I'll keep pressing. Thanks, Joy. In talking with Joy earlier this week, she said that one of the things that she'd really like to see come from the, uh, from the uh, summit was some way forward, some, uh, some means of, uh, of progressing the, the issue of how to humanely and effectively deal with cats where they're perceived to be having problems that we wish to deal with. And I thought uh, one way to do this would be to use a decision tree type analysis. And I've got a couple of examples of that from work I've been involved with over the, uh, the last several years. But essentially, in decision trees, you're looking at uh, a, a whole range of decision criteria. You've got a situation, a, uh, perhaps a, a population of, uh, of an endangered species you, you wish to protect. You've got uh, a colony of cats living in, uh, in a suburban area that's not doing very well. And you want to know what the options are, how best to, to deal with, the, uh, with this situation you've come across. What can we do to, uh, to improve the situation for it, for uh, everybody concerned, including the cats? And there are a number of questions that you can, that you can raise. Some of these are here. Um, I'll just briefly illustrate a couple of examples because most of my work has been on feral cats, 
feral cats tend to occur in uh, some of the most remote places where it's, there are no humans living for, uh, for many kilometres. My main site is in the Simpson Desert, and the nearest uh, population centre from the, uh, where we work is about 150 kilometres away. There are cats throughout the environment, and our work over the, the last 20-odd years has shown that they do have very detrimental effects on native species at particular times. Now, that's one area, and we could say, well, how can we deal with uh, the feral cat impact there? But we might want to look more broadly, because feral cats do occur across the entire continent, as well as on many offshore islands throughout the Pacific, and many islands, in fact, worldwide, and they're having negative impacts in many of those areas. In this situation, a decision tree was, uh, was built on the, by dividing Australia up into bioregions. So each of the areas here, shown in different colours, represents a different bioregion with different uh, ecological, environmental, physical, soil characteristics. And in each bioregion, we tallied up the numbers of threatened species, that's nationally threatened species, that might be at risk from predation by feral cats. The risk of predation was assessed by the size of the species involved, their behaviour, whether they're active at night or by day, whether they spend time in the trees or underground. So something like a, a small hopping rodent, a hopping mouse, would be at particular risk in open areas. So that would rate highly. Tallying up the numbers of these species, uh, multiplying that by the amount of risk they might be expected to face, you come out with something like this, where the numbers on the, uh, on the different bioregions represent the degree of risk that that region's already threatened fauna might face. And from that, you might see that uh, areas in the southeast, the southeast highlands, southeast coastal regions, tend to come fairly high. They're prominent areas with lots of species potentially at risk from feral cats. If you're looking at making a decision about where management actions might take place, the southeast would then be a place to, to focus on. But there are other considerations too, and one example from my own work over the, uh, the last several years, we've worked in central Australia, the Simpson Desert. The panel here shows the bottom part of the panel here, the capture rate of one of the native species. We started in 1990. You can see some eruptions here, low numbers here. The numbers erupt again here. And then again, towards, the, uh, towards more recent times with uh, a big eruption over the last couple of years. Each eruption is driven by heavy rainfall over the summer. So we can predict exactly when the animals are going to increase. So here are the big rainfall events. And if you just draw your eye down, within six months, there's an eruption in these native rodents. At the same time, spotlighting and uh, counting of prints on the, uh, on the sand, collecting cat and fox droppings, shows that that's a time for fairly intense predation by the, the two predator species too. In fact, the predation gets to be so intense during these periods shown here by the dark, by the black arrows. Whoops, sorry about that. I think my thumbs are too thick. <laughs> yeah, during these times, the predation can be so intense that often you'll go for long periods, sometimes many years, where you don't see these species at all. This is one example of a species that came back. We've had two examples of species that disappeared due to intense per capita predation from cats and foxes for about 15 years. One species has disappeared regionally from the Simpson Desert, well, at least from the 8,000 square kilometres that we monitor. If you're a manager and want to try to ameliorate the effects of feral cats and foxes on populations of native species, these are the periods you would focus on. And uh, just to show what, an, what a decision tree might look like, this is one that uh, Joy very kindly drafted. I haven't uh, actually had a chance to, to go through it in great detail. But it, it takes the, the issue to begin with. You've got uh, free roaming cats in this case, unsocialized cats. What do you do with them? The first question might be to ask, where do they occur? If they occur in a city or town environment, then there are a number of further questions that you might want to follow whether they occur in residential neighbourhoods, whether they're on uh, an industrial complex or a university campus. And you can follow the, uh, follow the questions down, making decisions that are appropriate for your time, your place, your situation, and the outcome that you desire. And again, you can move down through this to rural 
to uh, remote situations where the, uh, where the outcomes and possibilities for, uh, for gaining those outcomes will differ. So as a, a potential way forward, decision tree analyses may be a, a very useful tool. And I'd just like to leave, leave you with that thought. Hopefully we'll come back to it. Thank you. The decision tree idea that Chris came up with I thought was a really good um, concept because often um, the same thing doesn't apply to in every place and every time but if we started to break it all down it might give us some solutions instead of um, starting to talk holistic, talking holistically the whole time. Okay, I'd now like to welcome um, Maggie Lilith. Um, Maggie who did her PhD in this area in Western Australia. Look forward to hearing a little bit about her findings. Thanks, Maggie. Thank you. Um, it was a very long-winded title for a thesis, I'm sure. Um, I don't have a slide, or any slides. I just wanted to speak, uh, perhaps to tell you a bit more about the PhD and what I found. It, um, there were several parts to the PhD, and one of it was actually to conduct a survey of residents within a, a peri-urban and urban area in Western Australia. It's called the City of Armadale. We sent out 2,000 survey letters to ask people how they felt about cat legislation and various other husbandry questions like, would you keep your cat inside? Do you already keep your cat inside, etc. Um, I know a lot of speakers covered, um, you know, community support and m what came out of the survey was something like 90, I should know all this by heart, but 97% but of people surveyed wanted cat legislation of sorts. Um, people also wanted a restriction on the number of cats per household, limited to two. There were about 98% support for that. Um, people also wanted cat owners to keep their cats inside. About 90 or 80 to 90 percent support for keeping your cats indoors. So when we talk about, and a lot of decision makers come back and say, oh, well, people don't want cat legislation, or people will oppose some compulsory type legislation. There were these, my survey is one of two surveys that were done in Western Australia and it came up with very high support for some compulsory type legislation. Whether it's, um, you know, compulsory desexing, registration, limiting numbers, it was all around 70 to probably about 98%. The other part um, of the PhD was about, um, I radio track people's cats. Um, there were 16 cats that were volunteered. These cats were fed twice daily, so they were loved and um, very much loved and cared for. They weren't stray cats by any stretch of the imagination. So all but one uh, were allowed to roam freely day and night. And what we found was, um, now I did it over a two-day period, and we found that the highest home range for one cat was about 2.86 hectares, which is about seven acres. Um, and, and this was in a rural area. One of the urban cats had about 1.6 acre home range. So it's still fairly large for cats that are being fed and, you know, it will come home and get fed and then wander out and do whatever it's doing. The last part was trapping native mammals in each area and coincidentally the city of Armadale had two subdivisions, one of which was banning all cats totally, in the, in the subdivision. The other one was if you had cats, you had to have two bells and be kept inside. <laughs> that was India rules, I think. It was um, in the estate. Um, so, and both of these areas backed onto native bushland, so I was fortunate enough to be able to set up traps to see what type of native animals would be there compared to two areas where cats were allowed to roam free. Interestingly enough, the one, the subdivision which prohibits cat ownership totally had no animals at all. Now, when you bulldoze every single tree to build a new housing estate and then just say, well, we're going to ban cats or dogs or any form of cat ownership or pet ownership, 
it really is a waste of time because you know you've taken all the native animals. You've taken I couldn't even find a gecko. Um, it was at the end of three years, I think I found a marsupial mouse, and it was probably the start of animals coming, starting to come back in. So maybe in the long run it might be beneficial, but, um, and I know Joy mentioned you know, the holistic approach, but it, it does need the local government, it does need pet owners being responsible to stop strays you know, and dumping, as Lila said, you know, dumping a cat into a colony as well. Um, and I think there was strong support. I mean, my, my PhD showed that there was strong support just from owners and non-owners as well. So that was all I was going to talk about. Thanks, Joy. Um, Mark and Shell. We'll, uh, instead of me coming back next time, um, I'll call up Mark next and then Shell, who's going to talk for five minutes um, each about their perspectives as well. Thank you. At lunch, somebody asked me, is there anything you haven't done? Uh, my experience with trap, neuter, vaccinate and release comes from two different perspectives. One is a superintendent for the Newport News Animal Services Division. We had a feral cat problem within our city proper. Um, folks randomly feeding colony cats behind restaurants and businesses, not necessarily on their own property. And our city implemented a trap, neuter, and eradicate program uh, over my personal objections because I explained that we really weren't going to do anything except continue to bail the ocean with a thimble. So as a response to that, we enacted a feral cat caregiver ordinance which allowed individuals to register with the city, maintain a colony of cats on or about their property. They had a number of restrictions that they had to meet, including education, trapping, neutering, and ensuring that any new cats that came into their area were also trapped, placement for kittens, and they had to achieve that by getting the permission of their six surrounding adjacent properties to ensure that at least within that one acre or so free range, which we amazingly matched, um, that the cats were welcomed and not going to end up being uh, befalling any ill will from the neighbors. So that program worked out fairly well. We had several folks that registered themselves as feral cat caregivers. We were able to meet and finally greet some of the uh, clandestine ninja cat feeders. These are people that uh, would show up at uh, O-Dark 30 literally dressed in black with 50 pound bags of cat food, dump them on pieces of cardboard and sneak away in the middle of the night. When you have to use wildlife capture cameras and sit in cars blacked out with infrared detection gear, you know you are after some really sneaky people. <laughs> I have seen what a little old lady in tennis shoes will do when she's confronted by a law enforcement officer at one o'clock in the morning. They scream, jump in a car, and run away like the baddest bank robber you have ever seen. Fast forward to Montgomery County where we have a, uh, our program Snip, Tip and Chip is a trap, neuter, vaccinate, release program with an identified caregiver. In this program, which was grant funded by PetSmart Charities, we tried to uh, target two separate districts which we originally had contracts with that were our highest volume cat intake locations. Um, cats that came in from this area, uh, folks could bring them into the shelter and for a kitty copay of either five or ten dollars, depending on whether we were removing testicles or ovaries, we would fix their cat, ear tip it, taking off a quarter of an inch of one ear, um, microchip it, vaccinate it for rabies as well as regular cat diseases. We did not test um, for feline leukemia as a matter of course during the program. However, we did give folks the option to test at their expense if they chose to do so. Our goal was to do about a thousand cats over the period of this grant in two years. And as I mentioned before in a couple of the other presentations, what we saw was uh, almost a 50% reduction in the number of cats coming in through our program uh, from 3,300 to about 1,550 cats. So we saw that to be very effective. One of the facets that we did have to go with in that program is abandonment is illegal. Uh, as an animal control officer, I can't condone someone abandoning an animal, i.e. forsaking it, never providing it any care. The program required and the microchip ensured that should these animals come back through the system that a caregiver was identified. The local ordinances were modified to change the at-large provision to allow animals which had gone through the program to be exempt from that particular stricture. As we don't have cat licensing in Ohio, there was no license requirement to be waived. But again, in two years of the program, we never had another cat come back through that we'd microchipped with this program. We didn't see them again. 
we consider the program a success. And as a government agency, sometimes it's difficult to, uh, to claim success when you're dealing with a, a very controversial program. What we found is that when people are tasked and given some measure of responsibility, some type of accountability, the program seems to thrive and do better than if we simply say, just fix them and dump them. Um, that's been our experience with our program. We look forward to you know, working on that in the future. Uh, we hope to reduce our numbers even more. Our biggest problem during kitten season is neonate kittens coming through. Folks just simply see a litter of kittens, bring it into us, and, and then we're stuck with where do we go with it. By doing the trap, neuter, uh, vaccinate, and release programs with the identified caregivers, we hope to reduce those unwanted litters and further reduce our, our numbers of euthanasia uh, because of age. So it's another way we're trying to get to zero in uh, Montgomery County, and thank you for your time. Um, hi, uh, I'm here today uh, to make a confession. I am referred to often as uh, the problem because I'm a semi-owned cat carer. I, I look after a community cat. But I'm not alone. A 2009 study into Victorian cat owners revealed that one in four people are feeding a cat other than their own regularly. In the same year, a study in South Australia showed that 53% of cat owners in the state were feeding a second cat that wasn't theirs. This is an enormous number of people who give homeless cats a bit of extra care. And as a result, unfortunately, tend to be a major contributor to the cat overpopulation problem. In fact, based on current owned cat populations, more than a million people could be feeding a cat right now who doesn't belong to them. In response to the discovery of these behaviours, Authorities and welfare groups created campaigns asking people to take action. In Victoria, it was called the Who's for Cats program. In South Australia, it was called Homeless Cats SA. And the action people were asked to take, bring those cats you're feeding into the shelter. Who's for Cats had a central character called Dave, who was portrayed as a hero for dropping two cats off at the pound. Homeless Cats SA referred to unknown cats in literature as a plague and advise people to call council about any homeless cats in their area. All roads leading to the shelter, which is basically the opposite of what we've been discussing here this week. We don't want these cats, who are otherwise healthy and have a regular source of food, to be entering shelters. Cats get stressed and sick, they're killed in shelters, and untamed cats are nearly always killed in shelters. It's a bad approach if less killing, cats, uh, less killing of cats is your goal. And what is this approach actually costing us? If we were to assume the off-quoted 100,000 cats die in shelters each year to be correct, and if we were to assume that it costs in the vicinity of 50 bucks to capture, transport, assess, hold, feed, clean, handle, inject and kill each of these impounded cats, the resources we're pumping into the current system of killing 100,000 cats is around $5 million a year. That's our opportunity cost. What kind of services could we offer the community for $5 million a year? How many cats could $5 million a year to sex? $5 million a year, that's the opportunity cost of our current model which refuses to support community cat carers. But all of this is just numbers. There's another cost to the individual cat lover and the individual cat. Now I had a photo. This is other cat. OC, this is my community cat. He's de sex and he's microchipped to my address. He'll never be a house cat. Don't let that sweet expression fool you. He'll, he'll eviscerate you. <laughs> uh, but he still has a life. He'll never be a house cat, but he still has a life and he, he is valuable and he should be valued. There is absolutely no future for an untamed cat like other cat in a shelter. He would be killed there. And we should be incredibly sorry that this is the system we've created that deals with cats like him. We tend to forget that up until the invention of kitty litter, 50 years ago, all cats lived outdoors in the way that other cat does. People fed them 
and cared for them, and that was just how it was done. Ironically, the biggest risk to a cat's life today is being rescued from this life by an animal shelter. Taking a couple of million cats off the street and starting to call them pets was never really going to do much to stabilise the free-roaming population, and killing 100,000 cats every year in the name of animal welfare makes absolutely no sense and continues to do nothing to improve outcomes. We can keep a million cats out of the shelter today by simply changing our message. Caring for a community cat, let us help you help them. We have an army of people who love cats enough to provide for a stray, who are already activated in a caring role, and who we know love cats. We simply need to tap into that love and help them help us keep cats out of shelters. We need to redirect our resources into providing the services needed to keep them, their community cats in a responsible way. Community cat carers and semi-owners, these people are our allies and we need all the help we can get if we want to get to zero. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Okay. Um, we just need to go to the last slide of that presentation in a minute, please. Yes. Um, so, we're thinking we probably need to create some sort of national wildcat discussion paper since we had lots of discussion in the past and created, created lots of issues and we've seen lots of different points of view today. So, we'd now like to open it up for you to ask questions of the panel. Um, we have uh, about almost 20 minutes, yes, to do that, to explore some of the solutions, not the problems, um, and to s perhaps then, from there, do some more with our stakeholders here up at the table um, in the future, many of whom have offered to do this in the next few months, um, to use some decision-making models to try to come up with an effective response. So, can we have some questions? We have two people with microphones here. I've just got a quick question. Obviously, um, we're already doing some trap neutering releasing, but my question is more um, in regards to a transient community, community. So we don't have people necessarily staying for long periods of time, and most of our trap neuter and release is happening around hotels and resort um, areas. So what would be the suggestion in regards to a non-continuous or non same caregiver situation. I guess maybe Lila touched on it a bit in New York, saying that you had no um, continuous giver program or no continued giving program for some people or for some trap neuter releases. Um, we're, we're not actually at that point. I think the, the point I was making was that this is what people are now considering. And it goes to the point that, you know, these cats are living on the streets and we're picking up healthy cats and bringing them into the shelters and killing them. And that's why the shelters are now saying we're not going to take in healthy strays any longer because they're not at risk for illness or, or, or um, you know, death, or at least not immediately. So I wasn't exactly saying that that's what we're doing. I'm saying some communities are considering that more and more frequently. Um, I'm not sure how to address, you know, the question of, you know, the, the non-permanent resident because those cats are there. Um, you know, do they need to be fed? If, if they're thriving, then you may just neuter them and leave them. And it doesn't have to be a, a caretaker system. So. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty much what we've been doing to this point. Yeah. You may want to try and address it by, by speaking to the business that the cats are congregating around and approach it from a... You know, this is your organic rodent control system. You know, put these guys on your payroll. It may be cheaper to purchase some flea medication to eliminate the potential for a flea infestation. It may be cheaper for them to spay and neuter the cats on their property so that they become, you know, virtual employees. You know, some, some businesses, some, some companies across the United States have taken that perspective that they'd rather have the cats they know than the cats that get dumped there. So by co-opting them into the situation, you may find that it's a lot less expensive for them, one, to uh, have cats on the property. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty much what we've been doing. And just talking to Sue, obviously, like, mining towns probably have the similar situation. But even with management, that's two years, two to three years 
transient, so you're getting a new manager, a new executive management company or team coming in every two to three years. So I was just asking what you're suggesting. Put your it in policy. That's yeah. the key. Get it in writing, get it into a, a mem memorandum of understanding, something that the next brand or batch of managers, that's the policy and the guidelines that they have to work with, so it makes it much harder for them to change just because the, the guy in the home office changed. Yeah. Thank you. Another question? Well, I, I have a question. <laughs> um, the study in uh, Armadale, I think it was, um, of this 16 or 17 volunteer cats, I was just curious to know if all the cats were de-sexed or if um, the cats that were not de-sexed were, um, you know, having a bigger sort of territory. Um, yes, they were all de-sexed. The one that had the largest <coughs> territory was probably a three-year-old Burmese. Um, and I think it had no other cats around him, so he thought he was the king, pretty much. Interesting. <laughs> Some more questions. Thank you. Um, am I right in thinking you're talking about the cats in Fiji? Yeah. Um, are there still quite a strong tourist industry? Yeah, there? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. So I've read about cat hotels where the tourists are in, invited to get involved with that sort of thing, and it's really successful. And you can get local hotels that advertise it and get the tourists involved. I think some other countries do that. Perhaps I could make a comment also from the university campus perspective. A lot of our caregivers on the campus are students, and so they're only there uh, maybe for two or three <coughs> years. The way they get involved is that they are missing their cats at home. <laughs> and so they get involved um, rather than... Uh, we try to discourage the students on campus from actually owning a cat while they're there, because then you have problems when they leave. Rather than them owning a cat, why don't they come and interact with the cats that are already living there and, and help with the care? And that's been an extremely successful approach. Other questions? Other concerns? <laughs> with the female cats being dissexed, um, is they don't need to have their stitches out or something afterwards? Like when, when they've been de-sexed, because don't you have to cut them open? How do you go about with the post-operative care? Well, we use absorbable skin sutures, so they don't have to um, be brought back in to have their sutures removed. So that's not an issue. And again, by doing the flank incisions, if, if there is a caregiver for the colony, they can very easily observe you know, those incisions and make sure that um, you know, the animals are not disturbing them. Did you have a comment? Uh, yes, we, we routinely would re return a male cat the same day um, as he is dissexed. Um, normally we would keep the females in overnight at the vets but return them the following afternoon. We have never, ever had a situation where that has caused problems. Same thing with our program. Folks would bring the animals in first thing in the morning in a trap. We would uh, sedate and anesthetize anywhere between 30 and 50 cats, males and females. Everybody would uh, have the factory installed equipment removed. And 4.35 o'clock in the afternoon, the folks would come pick up their traps with the aviso that males you can probably let loose this evening, hold the females in the trap overnight. If you see anything wrong, come back, see us. Thousand cats, zero returns. It's it, at least from that perspective, we've gotten very good at what we do. The veterinarians who handle those surgeries are generally very fast and proficient. You know, we use the rapid induction method, so you can simply give them an injectable uh, anesthetic and analgesic through the side of the trap, and it's, it's a production line. You know, we have two different veterinary uh, teaching hospitals that work with our facility, so we have interns, uh, third and fourth year vet students, and yeah, it, some days it, they're walking over top of each other when we have you know, that many animals and that many people in the clinic, but never had a return. Okay, we have another question. Um, this question is for Helen. I was just wondering what the objections were from the students originally with the campus cats. What were their concerns? 
Our main objection has been in terms of wildlife on the campus. Um, we have a very strong environmental science um, school there and indeed some of the most vocal opposition has been from academics in that school who have been talking to their students about how, how dangerous, it is, dangerous it is to have cats on the campus in terms of wildlife on the campus. Now I'm not naive and I, won't, I will never guarantee that none of our campus cats ever catches a bird on campus. But I always say, well, what is the alternative? What is the alternative? If we didn't feed them, then you wouldn't have any wildlife anyway. Um, there are many other threats to um, wildlife on an urban campus, including the humans, including the cars, including the monoculture in our fabulous looking gardens, all the concrete open spaces, all of those sorts of things. So my argument always, and I have had many discussions about this with students and staff on the campus, my argument is you can't be naive about it, but you've got to look at it in balance and what are the alternatives. So, Helen, can I just ask, over the time, um, just continuing on from that question, over time, do you think you have quelled some of the concerns from the environmental scientists or do you think it's still the same and every year a new lot of students get browbeaten about the concerns? Uh, it certainly is a regular topic of discussion at our information tables, but I think we've got, we've got better at thinking through and answering these objections, and I think that the the, the noise and, and the vocal opposition that was there when we started the program has certainly calmed down a lot, just because we are calm and rational about um, meeting those concerns. Um, I've got a question for you, Helen. Um, in terms of your closed colony it's at the sorry, university... Sorry. I'm over here, sorry. <laughs> Uh, who's the primary caregiver in, say, a situation where the welfare of one of the animals on campus is compromised and there is an investigation into the welfare of those animals? Who then um, is actually listed as the primary caregiver? Giver? Is it yourself? Is it the university? Is it the students? Um, all the cats that are microchipped and lifetime registered are registered to the Campus Cats New South Wales group, but with one person's name. It's usually myself, Colleen Ringe or Lisa Liffman, who are the three main um, office bearers of that particular organisation. Uh, the university does not take responsibility. We do as an organisation. So the university has essentially handed that um, responsibility to us as an organisation to look after the cats on the campus. And my other question is, if there's only 35 of those cats and they've all been desexed, um, was there any attempt to rehome those cats? We have rehomed those cats that are socialised, and over time, as we get closer to the cats that are really uh, initially what you could label as feral, I don't like that word in an <coughs> urban uh, um, context, but still, um, th th as the cats get to know their caregivers, they become more socialised. But basically, the population that we've got there at the moment, um, none of them would be uh, at all comfortable in a home, um, and uh, although they will be friendly with their feeder or feeders, they um, run away and hide from anybody else who comes close to them. Um, so uh, I think our um, rehoming program has really kind of reached a limit, apart from maybe occasional cats. Now, there's a different thing here. We occasionally get cats dumped on the, on the campus. And, that was uh, my other question. Um, it's, it doesn't happen often, but we, we find them very, very quickly because, um, you know, they're looking for food and, and they're friendly with our feeders. And what we... Uh, we have an arrangement with the university that if cats are dumped, we will uh, uh, take them and, and rehome them where we can. And most of these are domesticated cats who are dumped, so it's relatively easy to rehome them. So we have a resident population that's probably not rehomeable, but the occasional dumped cat that we can find a home for. We had to have folks post signs that say, "Don't abandon cats here. Don't feed. These are tended cats," because we had the same problem. The word gets out that you have a well-tended, well, well-fed colony, and folks think, "Oh, it's a great place to dump." Uh, unaltered cat and then you end up with a litter of kittens so part of our caregiver program required that they post signage. Um, I'm not sure who to post this question to um, so I'll just put it out there. Um, in terms of uh, the um, animal management or animal control side of things um, one of the uh, hurdles to TNR in a community is problem cats or 
complaint cats spraying or fighting or noise or whichever. How does TNR have a place there? Do we simply have to look at relocation elsewhere? Um, or how do we try and factor that into part of the solution? Because I think that's going to be a you know, major source of, of um, complaint and issue, uh, particularly in our own state facing this leg well, new legislation in November. Perhaps I could just make a comment. The best way to deal with the problem male cat is cut his furry little balls off. And they really do calm down. And, and we've seen some studies where, in fact, um, the animal control agencies have said that the number of complaints they've gotten have gone down as a result of the program because now the cats aren't, they're not roaming, they're being fed, and a lot of the, the source of the complaints is being removed, you know, just as, as you know, we should comment it, that neuter the males. And, um, and, and uh, well, also, you know, part of the, the issue is getting the females because when they're in heat, we all know the racket that they can make. But um, certainly, we've seen the complaints go down just as a result of, of these programs. Yeah, part of it is, is education. And when there's an identified adverse behavior that people are encountering, whether it's cars, cars being scratched, flower beds being dug up, you know, sandboxes being used as litter boxes, sometimes going a few steps towards educating the person with the complaint can help resolve a great deal of that. Um, in some cases where you have cats that are going to be at risk, you know, the, the person who's making the complaint says, if the cat comes back, I'll shoot it, I'll poison it, I'll drown it in a barrel of water, then you need to act from a welfare standpoint for the animal and determine that whether or not that it's a safe place to return the cat. Um, most programs, again, where we've worked, we have an identified caregiver, so there is a, a, a local advocate for the cat. Um, there are other programs that simply take in the cat fix it and then return it to the same geographic area. And we've encountered problems with that, you know, in some jurisdictions where we've actually seen caregivers cited by the local police department for cats that they had fixed, returned to the area, and then they were cited for. So I, I don't think there's a single answer to that question. Um, it's something that as these programs become more and more commonplace that is going to be answered in practice versus answered in theory. So. I'd say the jury's still out. We'll wait for the verdict to come back, and I'll let you know how that goes. Thanks. More questions, concerns, or even comments about what we are proposing to do all the way forward would be very interesting. Thanks. Uh, just a comment. You know, I think I think the way you're going is great. Chris's decision tree is fantastic. I think everybody here is probably here because they're in some way a cat lover. And as soon as we go out into the, the Australian world, <laughs> there's as many cat non-lovers. So whatever program we decide to come up with, whatever paper and then further on, we've got to take that into account. And I think it's absolutely essential that we do, you know, and look at as many studies as have gone before, encourage others to study cats and their behavior, um, look at Chris's work, get him behind this so that people are looking at respected you know, academics who can actually give a valued opinion and it's not just seen as the cat lover's solution. Mm -hmm. Yep, excellent point. And I, I guess just a, a comment on that. Um, the study from Bennett's group, uh, I think it was about 14% of people hated cats. So it's, it's still quite a minority. And if you look at the US data where people were asked whether they'd like to kill the cat or, or you know, leave it on the street, certainly the, the majority support is not to kill the cat. So the ones that don't like cats tend to be pretty vocal. Mm. Um, I had a bit of a comment that sort of goes along that. We have this belief, obviously, that a lot of Australians don't like cats. And I've heard a couple of times uh, over the last few days that cat ownership has been dropping. Um, for the first time, there's a new study at, out last year, and for the first time in 10 years, cat ownership is actually now on the increase, which is great for everyone here. It's a tiny increase, but at least it's not dropping anymore. Yeah, I just wanted to make a comment. Um, Dr. Professor Rand's uh, research has, has shown that a very large number of cats entering shelters are unowned or semi-owned. And the point to make here is that mandatory dissexing will do absolutely nothing to, to address those cats. And sort of mandatory dissexing makes it harder to care for free-living cats. 
Yep. Um, the comment I would make on that is that a lot of the cats that come into shelters um, and pounds are socialised. So they might be the semi-owned um, or the ones that have had some sort of human contact. And very much, therefore, somebody has probably owned a cat at some stage that has had a litter and it might be an accidental litter, but there's a lot of those cats that are coming in um, that are surrendered, as Jackie's information showed, and our original data before we started to get our numbers down. Huge numbers of owners who just didn't get around to dissexing. Um, something like 40 to 60% of owners just hadn't got around to it yet before their cat had a litter. So I don't see it as a punitive thing. I think it, I see it as a support network for saying to people, we want only responsible breeding. If you want to breed, you have to consider yourself a breeder if you have an undersex cat because it will breed really fast and from something like four months. So if you're going to not dissex it, we need somebody to be able to say to them, look, you need to dissex that cat or get a breeder permit and take along the responsibilities that go with that. Absolutely. I think a lot of, sorry, go on, Matt. I'm just curious, where in the United States have they had mandatory dissexing? Do you have a city or a location to go with that? No, I certainly read about it on Jackson Express blogs. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Where it's been introduced. No offense intended, but I am not aware of any city and I'm not aware of any locality that's in that has enacted a mandatory dissexing for all the animals with the exception of San Francisco, which repealed it. Um, and Santa Cruz has, has regulations on that as well. But again, it's a mandatory dissexing across the board. There are. It, it's not a, a standard practice of law within the within the United States, and it's it's not an adequate description. We have lots of folks that believe that setting up for mandatory spaying and neutering should be across the board. But unfortunately, the only the only ever efforts that we've seen that have been, shall we say, applied have been as a result of court orders. Uh, you know, Virginia, Ohio. You know, most of the most of the states. Simply, you can't prevail on that over property rights, and that's actually where the, the BSL has made its biggest challenges because people are arguing over the rights of the, the government to impose certain restrictions. Even licensing is, is facing challenges in some places and being overturned as too onerous a restriction. So. Mm -hmm. But we're not saying not having community support programs. I mean, we strongly support community, cooperative community subsidy programs, absolutely. And without them, I wouldn't do it. And it has to be the two coupled together so that you support the people and it's really obvious that that service is available. And I think, you know, the data from the Gold Coast, which is Australian data, is showing dropping entry into shelters. Um, and we have to address both populations. It, you know, and... and there's no simple solution, you know, as I alluded to. It's multiple areas that we have to address, but 40% of the kittens are from owned queens, uh, and it's largely the spay delay. Uh, the other 60% are the semi-owned uh, cats because most of those are not feral. And so we have to have different strategies, and, and the data from the US about the cost of desexing, if you don't perceive your owner, it's probably got to be less it has to be less than twenty dollars so we have to address all those issues but if it co if it saves municipal agencies and it saves shelters and animal welfare agencies by having desexing programs in the community it actually saves them money that's where we need to be putting our resources mm. can i yeah i think the the greatest actually i mean People who are compliant with the law will comply, um, and the people who don't, don't. I think the greatest benefit, actually, of mandatory desexing is actually getting veterinarians to desex early. 
And I have to say, I mean, I'm a veterinarian, but I think at the moment veterinarians are part of the problem. And that's because the universities aren't training them. And you know, there's way forward in its partnerships with animal agencies that will go out and offer that to their veterinary students because students want to be trained in surgery. And if you give them that opportunity and um, you know, government funding is likely to decrease with the new government, um, you know, they can't afford to do it, but if you give them those opportunities, they'll take it. And I heard about Cat Haven also offering that to Murdoch University. You know, they're great partnerships. And we, ha we graduate about 700 veterinarians across Australia every year. Now, if you have 700 veterinari new veterinarians all graduating with hands-on skills of early age desexing and understanding the problems that shelters face, think about the situation in five years' time. This roadblock by veterinarians is going to disappear. Okay, another well, question. I'm, I'm sorry, can I go next? <laughs> sorry? Me? Me? Oh, sorry, Mandy. I That's didn't... okay. I've, got um, I've, in just, my eyes. I can't really I've just got a couple of comments. Um, with the surrendered cats, somebody mentioned, um, and, and in Jackie's figures that are from RSPCA, I guess one little caveat I might put on some of those figures is that people, when they surrender an animal, uh, will often say it's a stray when it may not be, and they may be they may have been feeding it for a while, um, and and we actually charge money for them surrendering their own cats. So sometimes some of those figures might actually be cats that they they did own, but they didn't want to pay the surrender fee. Number one thing I wanted to mention. I'm really interested in Chris Chris's uh, decision tree because I think we really. I mean, I'm a big cat lover, as everyone will, will know, but I think that we can't be a speciesist, so we have to worry about the welfare of all animals, and that's why Chrissy's idea of, of the decision, or, you know, the two of you together working out where these cats are, because I've read research that's looked at the injuries to wildlife that have come into wildlife hospitals from cat attacks, apart from worrying about um, the vulnerability of species, um, even if we don't think about that, if we actually think about the injuries done to wildlife and the ones that come into wildlife hospitals are only a small percentage of wildlife that would be attacked by cats. So I think we really have to remember that when we start thinking about trap neuter release. Third thing, we've got to think, consider the legal situation. In Queensland, it's very unlikely the trap neuter release will be legal in the near future. I've talked to the government about this. They are not going to change their idea about about trap neuter release. The laws in some of the other states are a little bit easier to get around um, because if there's a caretaker, they don't see that as abandoning, but it's, a, it's, a, it's an issue that has to be looked at. And I think there's a little bit of a difference between <clears throat> sort of accepting that we might have a cat that we own that's inside our house and perhaps one cat, like, like Shell talked about, having a, a, the other cat that is... That, that she's taken on that sort of responsibility for. And that's a little bit different than a whole colony of cats that could be doing damage to a, a particular environment. So that was just some mm -hmm. comments. And just in relation to the legislation, I did invite somebody from the Queensland Government, but unfortunately they couldn't make it today. But um, the, I think that there's, as somebody said yesterday, it might have been Lila or Sharon, you've got to, often got to look at the actual legislation and there, there may be ways to create new niches between the really wild, unsocialised cat that's out in inland Australia and a domestic cat, the definition of a domestic cat in Queensland is a cat that is fed and kept. Now that would be fit the, um, the model that Helen's running because those animals are fed and kept. So it's just a matter maybe of tweaking it a little bit so that it can be applied. Um, and I believe there's some biosecurity uh, bill that's going up at the end of the year that I can talk to you a bit more about, Mandy, that maybe we should work on together to see if we can find that sort of loophole where there is an area that it could be trialled. Perhaps looking, looking for solutions, yeah. Um, I just wanted to make a comment. Jackie, your talk was really great and those statistics were, you know, things that we need to know. And Shell, your situation with the surveys in South Australia and Victoria just confirmed that I think we need to put resources into actually going and saying to people, you know, if you're feeding a cat, you actually should take the responsible step desex it, microchip it and own it. 
And maybe if we put the resources into giving those people the opportunity to be good pet owners, we will, according to Jackie's figures, bring down a lot of the incoming cats that are coming into shelters. Um, just a, a, a comment in terms of um, wildlife and cats um, in how to perhaps demonstrate it or talk about it um, because you know, it is a, a concern, it's validity unknown, but uh, it's a concern that we're going to face um, is that cats, particularly outside pet cats, can support your carnivorous birds or your, your, your birds that like cat biscuits and cat food very, and other mammals really well. Um, but how do we reduce our pussy print as such in terms of songbirds, which is really what they're talking about is the, the smaller flying birds. Um, does anybody have any experience of offsetting, like a, you know, carving tax kind of thing for songbirds to Chris? support? Yeah, perhaps I could add a comment about that. Uh, we've um, actually done a little bit of work on cats in, the, uh, in Sydney bushland and you might expect from the uh, from the media that you that you hear that any cats in the bushland will be inevitably bad, and uh, there will be calls to uh, to remove them, destroy them, whatever. But uh, in fact, if you look at the the uh, nest predation rates on tree nesting birds, things like eastern yellow robins, if you've got cats in the in those bushland patches, you get a reduction in the in the predation rates, and it's because of um, an indirect interaction mediated through the introduced black rat. Where there are cats, cats see the black rats, there are fewer black rats then to go up the trees and get to the birds' nests that uh, otherwise would be, uh, would be an open slather for the rats. It's not to say that cats would, uh, wouldn't have detrimental effects on ground nesting birds, wrens and tree runners and things like that, but um, in terms of some of the tree nesters, there can be beneficial effects. I think one of the, uh, one of the important lessons is that we've got to use really good ecological now, natural history, if you like, to try to really understand where, um, where the impacts of cats are, uh, are negative, whether positive or neutral, and in, use that to inform the decision tree sort of approach. I think we really have to sort of, thank you, Chris. I was sort of going to finish on that note, but we have a hand madly waving at the back, Tim. Not madly. <laughs> <laughs> and you're casting aspersions on me, Joy. Um, it's sort of partially a question and then also a little bit of an observation, I guess. I'm just wondering, and I guess I'm kind of trying to address this to everybody, is it does concern me a little bit when we start to talk about mandatory desexing, whether we're actually all talking about the same thing, because I see discussions over here with, you know, recommend council or government programs that relate to desexing newly sold pets. So just saying, look, it's all a bit too hard to go and try and take cat off you know, grandma, 12 year old cat off grandma over there and get it to sex. We're just talking about newly adopted pets sort of from now on. And you can start to talk about that programs and then you'll hear these arguments coming from over here saying a mandatory desexing doesn't work. But we're not actually talking about the same thing. So when people talk about mandatory desexing, to some people that's desexing everything. To some people you're talking about mandatory desexing of certain populations of animals from certain points in time. And then you get discussions, even when you talk about that, about people who might disagree suggest that shelter pets should be desexed, but, you know, pets bought through pet stores shouldn't. So mm. it's just an observation from my perspective that I do see a lot of disagreement and discussion, often that, from my perspective, people are talking about completely different things, mm. and especially if you use the phrase mandatory desexing to, as a sort of a catch-all, it, it may be that you're <laughs> arguing about something that the other person isn't actually uh, advocating mm. for. So it was just a suggestion that if mm. we get into these discussions about desexing, we perhaps endeavour to clarify as much as we can about what we're actually talking about. Yes, I agree, Tim. And, and over the years, we've started to use the term more responsible breeding legislation, because the term mandatory desexing has got had many different interpretations, and as you say, it can be used very differently. Um, what we're talking about is raising the realisation that if you're going to breed more cats, then you are a breeder, and you are contributing to growing numbers of animals that um, when there's already, you know, so many that we can't um, look after af appropriately. So, um, so it's really about not being punishing anyone. It's a, it's a positive thing. It's a ch it, to me, it's an educational change. It's a change in attitude. Um, and even the cat breeding organisations, the three of the four cat breeding organisations who were part of our development of our legislation and Dogs Queensland were, were very supportive um, of feeling that it was going to 
um, raise the profile that cats needed to be well cared for and not just allowed to breed willy-nilly and um, that people, you know, would feel more responsible for them. So um, they weren't opposed to it at all either. So, okay. So on that note, um, I think that we'd, um, we've gone well over our time, but I'd just like you all to join with me and thanking this wonderful panel with this wealth of information and I think we have made progress today. We have um, so much more that we can do um, for the future I think based on what we've talked about today. So thank you all very, very much. And um, I'd just like to ask um, Nell to come up please. embarrass her now. Um, the other thing that we would love to do is um, just take this opportunity to thank Nell for the brilliant job she's done at organising this conference. She is the most organised, the most um, thorough and um, kind and caring organiser that I've come across and uh, she's done a brilliant job and I can, you know, I know that you've had a great conference and uh, so could you please join with me in saying thank you so much to Nell for all that she's done to put this together. <laughs> And just to close, um, I need to thank our supporters, our sponsors and exhibitors, um, AWLA, AWLQ, Console. Thank you so much to John and Mark. Um, to uh, uh, to Purina, to Animals Australia, Shelter Buddy, Home Safe ID, Therian, Kong, Trovan, Chemical Essentials, Black Dog Wear. Ocelot and Animal Care and Equipment Services. Um, they helped us tremendously in being able to keep the price of the conference as low as we possibly could, so thank you very much to all those people who've contributed there. Um, we'd also like to thank all our speakers who are still here with us. It's been a fantastic confidence, conference. Um, I don't know whether we've got all our four international speakers. We've still got Lila and Mark up here. Where's Sharon? Right here. Sharon. And where's Pam? Pam not here? No? Okay. Um, we, we thank you so much for going all this way over here to be part of our conference. Uh, it's always um, so enriching to have your contribution and uh, we, um, we just hope that you've enjoyed the conference as well because uh, we feel that you've just added such a tremendous amount of knowledge and enthusiasm and information for us to take away. So thank you all very much, especially to our international speakers. <laughs> and also to our local speakers, some of whom have come from the other side of Australia and New Zealand. Uh, you've done a, a wonderful job at enriching our, our experience as well, and so thank you for that. Um, and... Uh, We'd like to thank Outrigger for putting on the conference here for us uh, and looking after us for the time. And finally, to all you guys for continuing to come. Um, and who has been to summits before? Great, that's fantastic. Who's new this year? Ah, that's great as well. So we hope to see you back in another couple of years. Um, we hope that we will continue to move forward. This was um, a conference it's about working together to save more lives, but it was taking G to Z to the next level. We think it's growing and improving every time. And uh, so we're very, very grateful for your participation and your enthusiasm when you come along to these events. Uh, and so I think that's about it for now. Oh, yes, that's right. Nell has organised a little surprise under somebody's seat and you will have some spare seats near you. So it says you've won, is that right? It's a sticker on the bottom of your chair. You just need to check your chair and all the chairs near you. And she has a little prize for you. <laughs> so many spare chairs. <laughs> Thank you.
Do you know where it is? No, I didn't put it in. I just want to be Found it? Yay! <laughs> <laughs> and just a couple more things. Uh, feedback forms, hard copy are on your table, but you can also go to a Survey Monkey link. Um, papers and footage will be available on the G2Z website post summit, and they will, the presentations will be going up on YouTube, giving us a little bit of time to do that, or Nell time to do that. Um, and we um, welcome you to stay for afternoon tea and wish you a very safe journey home. So thank you, everybody, for coming. <laughs>